Hi, this is Tamson Granger. And this is Dan Abuhoff. With Tamson and Dan read the paper on Sunday, June 16th, 2019. Happy Father's Day, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, even though I'm introducing here, we have uh, Sadie actually sitting in. It's been a wild uh, weekend of a cavalcade of social occasions. It has. Um, celebrating the marriage, the wedding, really, of uh, Nico and Granger. And so I am pretty much talked out. I have nothing amusing or interesting to say. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Sadie. <laughs> Dan and Sadie. That's right, Dan and Sadie. Uh, apt on Father's Day. So uh, we'll see what the father-daughter dynamic is uh, today. See how, that, how far that takes us. Uh, Sadie, of course, being a keen observer uh, on all matters involving the family and social implications, generally speaking. And as your mother aptly put it, this was the weekend. Uh, perhaps we can provide a little explanation about what's been going on this weekend. There were a lot of events. Um, we had events Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And what was lovely is that we had a lot of family in town. Which I think a lot uh, of people... Can I, can I interrupt for a second? I don't think we ahead. told them that was, there was a wedding. Mom said it like three times. Did she? Okay. Yeah. All right. I wasn't listening. Yes. Um, but I thought it was nice that we had family in town. And um, I think we, we had family spread out across basically the East Coast, all the way from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Maryland, New York all over the place. So it was great to actually have them all in one location and to be able to spend time with them because these are the only types of events where we get to do that. So I think that was the big bonus for everyone here. Yeah. I mean, we have uh, what I'll call my side of the family. My brothers, uh, Bob and Michael here, Michael's sons, uh, Ryan and Sean were here. Your uh, cousin. Uh, my cousin Jack was here. His family was here. Uh, mom's uh, siblings, uh, two brothers, Steed and Bryce, her sister, uh, Sarah, uh, their, uh, you know, Bill, Sarah's uh, husband, uh, Lorna, Bryce's wife, and, and Sherry, Steve's, Steve's wife. wife. So, you know, there's that contingent. And um, there was uh, the other side of the families we would like to say, you know, and it, after all, the marriage of Granger and Nico. Uh, or as we say in the trade, uh, Nicole has bone and uh, she grew up in Florida in the Miami area and her family has uh, roots in South America. And so we had uh, a lot of folks who actually spoke a lot of Spanish uh, from different areas uh, in South America and Florida and even some other places. So uh, it was a large gathering. Uh, but I think one of the treats for us yeah. was Mr. West Coast. Zeke Abuhoff made it out. Hey, Mr. West Coast. Mr. West or as he's known, uh, your younger brother. My younger brother. We don't get to see him that often, so it's we nice don't... to see him on the East Coast. Yes. <laughs> he's a big crowd pleaser. See, well, well, especially his uh, wife, Noel. We can say his wife because they got married a month yes. or two ago. So, uh, so it was uh, a, one of these three party deals, uh, which is kind of new to me. I mean, I guess that's the way, maybe. But you have rehearsal dinner on Friday night. You have a... Uh, it wasn't really a rehearsal dinner. It was more of the actual event. Yes, we had the uh, wedding ceremony, of which uh, yours truly officiated. What do you think of that? That worked out in your mind? It was a, it was, it was casual, I would say. <laughs> it was casual. Casual. I kept it casual, non-religious. Mm-hmm. All right? Yes. But fascinating and interesting, and it drew you in, didn't it? Yes. You're sure. nodding. Sure. <laughs> and, sure. and then uh, Saturday... We had uh, the larger gathering for the big party and uh, with a tent and whole deal in the backyard. And uh, Sunday, uh, the after brunch. Um, and uh, with maybe, I don't know, 25 people, 30 people, something like that. Uh, and uh, it's been a lot of socializing. We had a great time. There was a DJ on uh, Saturday, a lot of uh, wild dancing, etc. It was the whole drill. Um, although, you know, what we did learn is that We've been certainly to a bunch of weddings that people do them in halls. Maybe that's the standard way to do it, is to rent some kind of venue and have uh, everything kind of taken care of. This was a little more uh, DIY. 
individual subcontracting, and then you're in your own home, of course. So you've got a caterer on Saturday and Sunday, but even so, there's, there's always a lot to be done. There's inter interstitial events and the like. And um, that was uh, kept us busy, kept us busy. Um, but everyone was uh, lovely about it. It's just kind of exhausting. That's why Tamsin's so tough. Yeah. You know, we should mention there's a third group of people other than the uh, relatives from various sides of the family. There was uh, a lot of water polo players, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, friends of uh, Granger and Nico that they play water polo with in their water polo club. Uh, and uh, there were quite a few of those folks. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also various. a few good family friends as well. Yeah, that's right. Going way back, well, of course, Finn and the like. So, uh, yeah, it was and a great Gamberts, time. Oh, that's one right. One of your favorite guest stars. We should, uh, previous guest stars, uh, David and Cindy Gompert were here. The Walshes. Uh, the Walshes, Tom and Lisa Walsh were here. Uh, yeah, you know, you don't want to leave anybody out, but uh, we can't possibly name everybody. But it was, um, it was something. It was a lot of, you know, I find it's a lot of social interaction for me. It's not the kind of thing I do on a regular basis. Exhausting. Yeah, you kind of run out of topics after a couple of days. Yeah, but uh, it was good. It was good. So uh, we're happy and we're kind of relaxed now after that. And uh, we're back. Uh, well, not back yet. We're going to work our way back once we finish all the leftover food uh, into uh, what I'll call real life. Um Real life. But real life has actually gone on while we've been, uh, you know, preparing for the wedding and doing the wedding itself, uh, and particular sports. And uh, I know you are a big follower of ice hockey. Yes. And uh, we had that uh, it was culminate. It a big sports week, really. Yeah. But, um... So what was your take on the hockey? The hockey, of course, the seven-game the seven game series. Seven-game series. Between the St. Louis Blues... And the Boston Bruins. Yes, the Blues and the Bruins. Um, I was excited that it made it to seven games. I had zero um, dogs in the race. Is it dogs in the race? Dogs in the fight. Dogs in the hunt, yes. What I started with was I am sort of a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. They were in the playoffs. They got eliminated by Boston. And then I moved on to be a Dallas Stars fan. They then got eliminated by, I believe, St. Louis. Or San Jose, one of those two. No, no San, San Jose was doing okay, their fine, own thing. Fine. And then I went to San Jose, and they got eliminated by, by St. Louis. Louis. All right, and, and then I had to pick St. Louis, you, because who's going to root for the Bruins? You had you picked a lot of losers, that's for sure. Yes, <laughs> um, but I picked the winner in the end, so that's what counts. Well, it's amazing that they won, that St. Louis won. I mean, that last seventh game, that was in Boston. Right, yeah. And, you know, they were coming out of the All-Star break. They were last in the league. So it was really a worst to first Cinderella yeah, story. Yeah, the St. Louis team was worst. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Were in early January, they were the worst record. And, uh, you know, it's funny. People, uh, my friend Harry, of course, doesn't uh, watch hockey. Uh, but he's telling me about the game afterwards. And he said, yeah, it was the craziest game. The first period, Boston comes out, and they're killing them. They're killing them. They've got shots from all over. And the only thing that's keeping uh, St. Louis in the game is their goalies playing a great first period. And then... Uh, they, they finally get a couple shots on goal, St. Louis does, and their second shot goes in. And they end up taking a 2 0 uh, lead in the first period, and that's the ball game. So it was all on the goalie. Right. It got late early. It got late early. But yeah. I said to him, You're watching, uh, you watched hockey on television? He said, No, uh, you know, you watched the whole game? He said, No, actually, only the second or third period. I listened to the first period on radio. I said, You were listening to hockey on the radio? I mean, how could you possibly keep it straight? You don't follow either of the teams. But in any well, event, I will say, Game 7 was not the most exciting of games because St. Louis got the lead early, kept the lead throughout. Yeah. Um, I think the real hockey fans are disappointed in that. But I think we were all happy that it got to a Game 7. Yeah, that's a very, uh, it's very dramatic. Everyone had their money on Boston. It was great. St. Louis has never won a Stanley Cup before. Right. This was their first Stanley Cup. Right. So I think that was the great... Um, result that another another team has a Stanley Cup under their belt. Well, yeah, it's nice to to spread it around. I hate to see you know one really dominant dynasty, and now we got to see you know. I feel like as soon as the season ends, and now it's like who's going to be traded, who's going to find a new contract. Pittsburgh has a lot of work to do. I know the Maple Leafs have a lot of work to do. Well, that's that's your team, right? Yeah, but I'm curious to see what happens with Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh has you know kind of a team of legendary people on it, and they're not winning anymore, so they need to 
uh, make some changes. Well, you know, I, I don't know if you're on to this, but I think the first two picks in the draft are going to uh, the Rangers and the uh, and the Islanders. The Islanders or New Jersey? I think the Islanders. I don't know. Um, but the Rangers need some good players, so yeah. that's a good move. There are two superstars coming out, two highly thought of players, and they're both going to New York area teams. Huh. So you can look forward to that. Right. Yeah, all right. So hockey can really draw you in. There's no question about it, even for but a short time. And the St. Louis the folks team, went crazy. The yes. fans went crazy. Well, what I like about St. Louis is that their win song is Gloria. That's right. That's so right. I played a lot of Gloria this, this week. Really? It's just a fun song to play. It is. So why not? <laughs> yes, uh, I guess that's true. You know, there is that movie. They did sort of a remake of that Gloria movie with uh, right. Julianne Moore. Yes. I, uh, you haven't seen that, have you? I haven't seen the movie, but I'm a, I'm enthusiastic about the song. I think it's the right song choice. <laughs> okay. And it's a funny thing for a men's hockey team to be singing Gloria. Apparently, they had a night out at yeah. a bar in and, Philly, and, and they, they fell in love with it a lot, it. Yeah. and they liked it. So we'll take it. Yeah. It's better than nothing. Ah, no, no, it's good. But the other team that won for the first time ever, Toronto. Toronto basketball. As we switch to basketball, you know, the basketball. It's hard to beat the NBA basketball because. Uh, it's like it, they're, they're, they have so much talent. It's international. People come from different countries. They all have different stories. It feels like superstars are being discovered every three weeks. You get into the tournament, it's all about the Golden State team. Everybody knows how great they are with Curry and with Clay Thompson and the like. I don't and, want to take you on a tangent, but I was listening to a hockey um, radio show this morning, yeah. as one does. As <laughs> And <laughs> yeah. they were saying nothing but negative things about how boring basketball is and how easy it is and how oh, the athletes no, are yeah. not that um, exciting and yada, yada, yada. So everything you just said, they were saying the exact opposite. Oh, no, no. The athletes are fantastic. I Look, look it's, they're, they're such different sports. They're such different sports. It's obviously much harder to score a goal than it is to score a basket. But but they're just, they're just different sports. And, and these guys keep coming out of the woodwork, so you... You go from Golden State as the default choice going into the season, and then it's all about Giannis, the Greek freak, at a certain point, and he's leading Milwaukee to the best record in the regular season. They start charging through the playoffs, and then they get the throne, after, even after taking a 2 nothing series lead in the Eastern Finals by Toronto, uh, in particular led by a guy named Pascal Siakam, which no one had ever heard of, who's a guy from Cameroon, who was, was up for most improved player in the NBA. And it's just the guy who kept working on his game, but he's tremendously athletic. I didn't even know they gave out that trophy. Yeah, they do. That's like a middle school trophy. It is like there. a middle school trophy. And uh, this kid doesn't look like he's in middle school. He's uh, six foot six. He jumps to the ceiling of the uh, arena, and uh, he's a tremendous athlete. And, of course, they're led by Kawhi Leonard. And the big, the big bet that the Toronto team made going into the season was they they were stuck in what's called basketball purgatory. They had several years where they were good but not great. And a lot of teams get stuck in that, and they really are uncomfortable with doing well in regular season, winning one or two playoffs, uh, playoff rounds, but really not getting close to winning the championship. And it was all about winning the championship. And unless you have a bad record and you don't get the top, which prevents you from getting the top draft choice, you need that worst record to get the top draft choice, you're stuck on that treadmill. You can't get there. And this team was stuck. And they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a big chance. We're going to trade two of our better players for Kawhi Leonard. And Kawhi Leonard is one of the top players in the NBA, maybe the top four or five. But he's been hurt, and he's considered a malcontent. And he's only signed for one year. So we're signing two guys. I'm sorry, we're trading two guys. We're signing for three or four years. We're good. For Kawhi Leonard, for one, and we don't know if this is going to work. Let's see if he works with us. And... The incredible gamble they made paid off, and uh, Kawhi Leonard led them to the championship and was the most valuable player of the championship series. It was the second time he won it. He won it previously for the San Antonio Spurs. There are very few players who have won that twice. I can tell you who the other two are, unless you'd like to guess. Take a guess. You'll probably get one. Who have won two series or two Yeah, who won the most teams? valuable player in the finals trophies uh, for two different teams. LeBron? That's correct, you see. And who's when I, when I say and think of a very tall player who was the center in the league some years ago. Shaq. I mean, you're close, but tall and thin. Yao Ming. Uh, Kareem. Ah. Uh, it's a little before my time. A little uh, before my time. Yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. 
Right. Kareem yeah. Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Yes, he won it for two teams. Well, that, that story's funny just because I feel like the same thing happened with Toronto and Toronto, or Toronto, of course Toronto, but the Maple Leafs because they got Tavares this year. Yeah. And they've been a middling team and they had the opposite effect of they did get into the playoffs they didn't make it past the first round well Tavares I think is a great an excellent player he played for the Islanders I can tell you I don't think he's quite the transcendent player that Kawhi Leonard is it's a different sport anyway you really can affect the basketball team with one player but beyond that Tavares I'd say he's in the top 15 players in the league top 20 players in the league maybe and we're talking about Kawhi maybe the second or third best player in the league so uh and, and and now, of course, just as you spoke a moment ago, as soon as the season ends, the question is, where do the players land next year? You know, free agency trades. Same thing in basketball. They don't know where Kawhi Leonard is playing next year. Uh, and a matter of fact, it's likely it's not with Toronto. Likely it's going to be one of the Los Angeles teams, the Los Angeles Clippers. So they haven't quite figured it out. Is it a money thing? No. Is he too expensive for Toronto? No, because they have, there's a limit to how much you can offer a player. In the NBA, because right. they have a salary cap, he's yeah. getting the maximum wherever he goes. He's going to make the yeah. same amount of money wherever he goes. So it's wherever, whatever city he wants to be in. And he he feels, I'm sure that it, you know he likes Toronto fine, but he doesn't owe the folks in Toronto anything. He brought them a championship, so right. no one's going to give him a hard time if he goes. And I think he's going to go. Uh, and uh, Kevin Durant's going to go. I mean, he's injured, but he'll probably be with another team, the Golden State Star, uh, maybe even Clay Thompson, the Golden State Star. So that will get all get shaken up, but I think the one thing we can count on next year is the Knicks won't be any good. That's the way that normally works. Um, food. I found a food article I thought you might be interested in, right. uh, and you were, against right. all odds. It's called True Luxury and Food Doesn't Cost a Fortune, and it's all about how all those luxurious food items that people tend to covet, um, are they really worth the coveting? And the, the chef in the article makes the, the argument that the food that um, we should be coveting is the one that really resonates with us on kind of an emotional level, the one that we look forward to, the one that we think is, you know, we consider good food or makes us feel the best or the most, I don't know. Satisfied. Satisfied. There yeah. we go. Um, so I thought this was interesting because I feel like food is similar to art or even fashion in a way, in the sense that I've always gotten the advice that, you know, you, you got to like what you like and, you know, you can't just always focus on what's the trend and what's of the moment. If you don't like it, there's no point in really going after it. And that, that's kind of what this article says is they talk about how food trends kind of change over time and the things that are considered delicacies now were not delicacies, you know, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. And the delicacies that they had then are either common now or completely gross compared to what we eat now. Hmm. So, um, it's really, it kind of boils down these like really fancy food items like caviar and truffles and things like that down to, like, actually, this is kind of a trend, and you can cho choose whether you want to follow the trend or not. Um, but at the end of the day, you should be eating what you want to eat. Well, yeah, and the, and the question, too, is in your heart of hearts, what do you really enjoy? And, and at one point, the person who writes the article says, look, if someone said to me, uh, I'm going to present the, this, this choice of foods to you in a way that you would not have any sense of what the various prices are, what's considered trendy, what's considered popular, what's considered prized and expensive. Just line these things up. Just pick the foods that you like. What would you end up picking? And this person says, I'd pick uh, blueberries. I'd pick onions. Um, and, and fairly simple foods, fairly inexpensive foods. And I identify with that. I mean, I, look, I'm not the anti-fancy food. There's some food that's just well-prepared and it's very good. But the truth of the matter is, you know, to me... Fried eggs are, uh, are great. Toast is great. <laughs> well, what I think is funny is, so I know at work, like anytime anyone has a birthday, we'll yeah. always ask, you know, what are the big birthday plans? And sometimes it's, you know, the parents are in town we're going out to dinner with the family, something yeah. like that. Or I'm going to my parents' house and they're, my mom's making dinner. Yeah. 
And it's always interesting to hear what is their birthday dinner. Because, you know, everyone has a birthday dinner. That their mother prepared years ago? Yes. And what, and and what do you hear? I'll tell you what, it's never caviar. It's, <laughs> what it's is a it? Lot of, well, for us, I feel like the birthday dinner, you know, to request a dinner, I would say, you know, something like chicken parm would come up. Yeah, that's, I can see um, that. Yeah. You know, something, I think a lot of people have, you know, like a roast that their mom makes that they really like, something like that. Something kind of traditional, like family meal. Well, you would pick something like a pasta with garlic and oil, and, and yeah, I mean that's our traditional Christmas meal. Yeah. The problem is my birthday's in August, and having like a big heavy Italian yeah. meal yeah. when it's a hundred degrees well, you, outside is not always the optimal. Right. But it is always interesting to hear, you know, what people gravitate toward, and it never is those really fancy foods. It's always kind of something that their with. mother really yeah, you know, is good I, at making. I never thought about that, but so my mother used to. Uh, prepare chicken livers, right? And one of my favorite foods, even to this day, is chicken livers. And if you go into the supermarket and you want chicken livers, if it's in the case, you're going to get a whole big tub of it for like $3. Mm -hmm. it, it, they practically give them away. And frankly, sometimes it's not in the case. And you ask the guy, sometimes, you know, the butcher behind the glass thing, and they'll just give it to you. They'll say, here's a tub of chicken livers, congratulations, we're not going to charge you. I mean, that's how inexpensive or unprized chicken livers are. And to me, and I never made this connection until you mentioned it, it must be a family thing uh, growing up, chicken livers are great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but it's an odd psychology, the way people develop certain preferences with respect to food. I mean, you certainly respect people who have refined palates. But if you ask yourself, what do you really enjoy? Sometimes it's very simple. Well, I think food is always connected to, you know, what are you experiencing at the time? Like, for example, if you're going to a ballpark and, you know, you really love to go to see a baseball game and you're really looking forward to that hot dog, hot dogs are not fancy food, but mm. everyone loves to go get a hot dog at the ballpark because it's all part of the experience. Mm. You're looking forward to it. That's kind of part of the atmosphere is you want to get those traditional foods that are at the ballpark. And that kind of, I think that goes along with a lot of things is, you know, when, um, when you're go when you're having certain events or whatever, you want to have the food that is going to be that resonates with that event. Yeah, sure, sure. It's an it, well, people say it's an emotional connection. It's not, not just a matter of what it tastes like. Uh, yeah, I thought that article was interesting too. Uh, there's something in boxing which you know this came out of nowhere, and I don't expect you to be following this. No one's following this, and. and uh, and yet they say that uh, boxing is coming back and the heavyweight championship is, is going to be more important in the future. And the reason that a lot of publicity was uh, attached to this event was because there has been emerging uh, a fellow named Anthony Joshua, um, who is uh, British and uh, is a tremendous heavyweight fighter, supposedly. And he looks like a big, strong, powerfully muscular guy, he really looks the part and he looks kind of unbeatable. And he developed a big reputation in uh, Europe, and uh, he came over to uh, to the U.S. to fight a fairly insignificant fighter, or so it was thought to be a fellow named Andy Ruiz, who's this very heavy set Mexican guy, he looks like he's never worked out in his life, and you know, sort of a building block type of event um, to get some exposure before he had a real big championship bout. And uh, this is last week. This guy Andy Ruiz knocked him out. And I'm showing you the picture now of Andy Ruiz knocking out mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Joshua. And I think you can tell people that uh, Andrew, Andy Ruiz looks like he's never been in the gym in his entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, who is this guy? And he, he's now the first Mexican heavyweight championship of the world. Um, and so now we're, we're reading about him saying, well, what is this? Uh, and he gets on, he's been on the Kimmel Show, of course. That's the kind of thing you put on the Kimmel Show. And Kimmel came up with a nickname for him, which is called Rocky Mexicano, uh, like, uh, like the great fighters like Rocky Marciano, Rocky Graziano. And uh, they tell his story. And his is a story of a guy who's in sort of a, you know, somewhat hard luck upbringing you know, near the Mexican border, gets in trouble all the time, is in fights all the time. And he's out of school because he can't behave himself. His father has him doing day labor. He decides to try to make it as a fighter. He has some real ups and downs in that connection. And it finally implies himself, and supposedly he's been training hard. Uh, he had a reputation in his area, in Mexico, and he doesn't look like he's training hard, but they say that's just his body type. He's never going to look muscular. That's just the DNA. 
That's it. But they say the guy works like crazy. And sure enough, he knocked this fellow out. Uh, he knocked Anthony and Joshua out. And you know, you see that once in a while. I've seen a couple of fights uh, in my time. I know you don't follow boxing. Which it doesn't go to the guy who looks like he's the uh, the model for uh, you know men's fitness. It, it's not the way it works. Um, and this guy, I don't know if he's going to remain the heavyweight championship for any time. I, don't, I think he's nobody's idea of the poster boy for uh, heavyweight fighting. But he's got the title and uh, first Mexican champion. A very kind of weird and unexpected story. All right. So uh, the last uh, story uh, we really have, I mean, it's about sports, um, is about baseball. And you have fallen behind in your baseball Yes, hockey takes a lot out of me. It takes a lot out of me, but now I'll be able to refocus now that the Stanley Cup has been procured by the Blues. All right, well, good. But let me just to bring you up to speed quickly. The Mets are the Mets, which means that... Uh, They're just around 500, right? Oh, below, below. They're flagging. Last time I looked, they were like five games back. Uh, they're about three or four now. You've got that right. But they have a new rising star, and it's a fellow named Pete Alonzo. And Pete Alonso is becoming sort of a uh, legend. Uh, if you can believe the Mets have a guy who's capable of becoming a legend. He has 23 home runs. Now, if you think about that, that's amazing. He has 23 home it's runs. very early in the season. Yes. 23 home, <laughs> home runs. He's going to hit like 60 home runs. Well, I don't think it's going to hold up. But if you, that's the pace he's on. It, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the Mets never had a rookie hit more than 20 home runs. He's got 23 already. Uh, it's totally bizarre. And he's kind of not, you talk about a guy who doesn't look like a, you know, a, a model, a, a men's journal type guy. His nickname is the Polar Bear. Uh, they say he's known as the Polar Bear because he's six foot three, 245 pounds. Uh, he has a somewhat dense build, somewhat of a paunch. Um, but he's just an extremely powerful guy. They say they have a whole bunch of facts about Pete. I won't bore you with all of them. Well, but you know what I like about it in the picture? I respect a baseball player who wears his um, pants at a capri length instead of all the way down. <laughs> Do you think the it's players the traditional length <laughs> for their pants? Do you think the players call it capri length? Is that is that a baseball I think they term? They call it clam digger length. <laughs> clam I think digger it's clam length. digger or pedal pusher. Pedal pusher. There you go. Clam digger. You've heard of clam digger from me. Have you ever heard anyone else say clam digger? Yes, clam diggers is a thing. All right. So okay, I feel good about that because that's what my mother used to call it. In any event, here's a fact. Pete has always had a grown-up appetite. Alonzo was not allowed to eat off kids' menus growing up as his parents felt that processed food was bad for anybody. That's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Plus, it probably wasn't enough for him to eat. Um, his cooking education went beyond food. His father taught him how to uh, work in a glove by putting shaving cream on the glove and putting it in the microwave. And uh, even now, he does that. And, and uh, his wife complains about the smell uh, he, he's not very good at it. He tends to burn his baseball, burn his baseball gloves. That's been a little bit of a problem. I'm going to give his wife a pro tip. Spring for an extra microwave. <laughs> Put it in the basement and let him go to town. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, a tip from me to you. <laughs> that's, that's good advice. Um, he, uh, okay, here you go. His, he wants to get into the home run derby. You're familiar with the home run derby, the all-star game. Uh, yes. It he, was in the District of Columbia last year. Yes, yes, that's the Washington Baseball Club was uh, hosting. Uh, they say his back could help pay some bills. He has bills. Uh, pro he could be selected, a prospect he calls mind-boggling. Uh, as a rookie, he's making the minimum, which is $555,000, which sounds like a lot, but if you're a Major League Baseball player, it's not a lot. And this year... Major League Baseball added a $2.5 million pool of bonuses for the Home Run Derby, $1 million for the winner, and he says he wants he wants the million dollars. He wants, Guys never talk that way. Mm -hmm. He says, I want to be in the Home Run Derby. I want to win the million dollars. It would pay for my wedding costs. So he's in, right? Mm -hmm. He's up for that. He's very direct. And here is perhaps the best fact about Pete Alonso is that he's a favorite comic book hero, and it's not The Dark Knight. Quote, I've got a special pair of Superman underwear. Hmm. <laughs> Alonzo said, while standing with his fiancée before a screening for Avengers Endgame in well, Times Square. there's a lot of conflicts here. First of all, <laughs> you're playing baseball in Gotham, if you will, and yes. you're not even going to be a Batman fan. Second of all, why are you wearing a DC 
affiliated garment when you're going to see a Marvel movie. You know, I, I, a lot of contradictions in I was a little surprised how open he was and how willing he was to initiate a, a, a conversation about the underwear he was wearing. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's that kids today. <laughs> he's a very direct guy. Uh, yeah, so anyway, Pete Alonso was the future. The, so on the one hand, the Mets are going nowhere. It's the same old Mets. They find ways to lose that you wouldn't think possible. But uh, a guy like that, you know, he could be in the team for the next 15 years. Maybe it's next David Wright. You're a big David Wright fan. I was going to say, who's going to be the next David Wright? It's Pete Alonso, the where's, polar bear. Where's Cespedes for the rest of us? Is Cespedes, he still uh, on the uh, DL? You didn't hear what happened to Cespedes? No. Uh, so Cespedes... <laughs> He has, was on the DL. Uh, he had uh, surgery, and uh, he, he, everyone knew it was going to take him out um, until close to the All Star break. And then he lives on sort of a ranch. He uh, got hurt badly, breaking I think both his ankles on the ranch. The question is whether he was thrown from a horse. There was some speculation. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was something else. We can't get the details. It's I think what, that's grounds for breaking contracts. Yeah, you know, you're, you're thinking like a lawyer. It's, 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 uh, well, I just know all those pro athletes have rules against you know doing extreme sports, and I think one of them's probably horseback riding. Right. So I think he's denied that he was horseback riding, and I think they don't want to get in litigation against us, but it's if they can help it. But I, the good news is 75% of his contract is going to be covered by insurance. But he's not playing for this year. And between you and me, he'll never play for the Mets again. Yeah. Uh, they're moving on. There's a certain point psychologically you've got to say forget it. So there was one quote that I found that I thought was interesting because it was in the write-up of Rolling Thunder Review, which is the new Bob Dylan movie, and uh, I mentioned it to you, and um, and you... Said, the quote, yeah, that's a quote. Yes. I've, I've heard that before. Yes. Uh, it, it's uh, Life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. And uh, you said to me, uh, that's, uh, that quote's been around, and it turns out it's George Bernard Shaw. Uh, and I looked back at the article, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, Dylan kind of took it from George Bernard <laughs> Shaw. <laughs> kind of took it from George Bernard Shaw. I mean, I'm not criticizing Dylan, um, but it's funny that I think a major point in the movie is Dylan using someone else's quote. But it's kind of nice as George Bernard Shaw. The, I, who would have thought that uh, Dylan's quoting the guy who wrote uh, My Fair Lady. Yeah, right? it all comes back to My Fair Lady. It all, as, <laughs> I think Dylan will be the first one to say that. Uh, great. So I think we close. Uh, this has been a great Father's Day broadcast. This is why we have uh, father and daughter here. You know, I feel bad that we didn't talk about golf at all today. Did you want it? You have something to say? I have nothing to say about it. I just know that it's happening It's right happening. We're going to go check it now. It's U.S. Open. I was filled in. That's the nice thing about having a party with a lot of different people. I was told that the U.S. Open, since it's being played in Pebble Beach in California, starts this is the last round is this evening. It's going to go into 10 o'clock in the evening, possibly. And uh, Brooks Kepka is in the running uh, with Justin Rose and some other big names. So we'll see. So I even know a little bit about that, but I'll know more in a few hours. So I think you should, for the folks listening at home, Read to them the Father's Day card you gave me just yes. a few minutes ago. It says, when I grow up, I want to be as funny as you think you are. There you go. Uh, <laughs> no comments necessary. So uh, next week, uh, given the rest and relaxation she deserves, uh, I'll be back uh, with Hampson. But until then, uh, this is uh, Dan Abuhoff. And Sadie Abuhoff. For Tamsin and Dan, read the paper.